get into, and then we'll have the talk. And Dr. Clauser has said that he will entertain questions during the talk as long as they're really burning and pertinent. Uh, which, of course, all questions are, so that doesn't yeah, exclude anything I right? need to be asked. And the other thing I wanted to mention, I was going to introduce Roy, but he's already introduced himself. I'll just add a couple of things. Roy, this is possibly his fifth time uh, addressing our chapter, maybe fourth, I, I'm not counting well. But, uh, and it's, it, we keep getting him back because every time he talks, it's fantastic, and it's always new, and, you know, uh, we're lucky to have him today. And I just want to say one other thing about uh, Roy. He published a paper in the, um, not the March, it was the it's December the issue. December. The, the yeah. December issue of PSCF called Reading Genesis. I have one copy here, I'm not giving it out. Uh, it's 26 pages, but his email is there, and I strongly suggest everyone, whatever you think about. Genesis, evolution, anything, that you get a copy of this paper. I actually was so excited when I saw it that I brought it up at, a, at the BioLogos forum, and I, I don't know how many I sent out, but we shouldn't tell that to the officials at ASA. <laughs> the best way to get his paper and other papers at PSCF is to join ASA, and that's why, does anyone not have a flyer? So I have to make that sales pitch. It's, it's a great idea to join. Uh, this is going to be an annual meeting in July, and uh, I think you'll be happy if you do. Okay, with that, I'm going to give the floor to Roy, and thanks. Thank you, and thank you for the kind words. Um, anyone wants to write to me to further this discussion, or ask any questions, give me your zine criticisms, ask for an article, whatever. But I'm happy to, have to get to hear from you. Tonight I was assigned a topic. Last time I wasn't. Last time I said I have an early Christmas present for you. And I laid out the stuff that later became that article. Uh, but tonight I was asked to address the issue of the different cosmologies that are in the air today. The present day cosmology. Not the history of cosmology. <laughs> but just the say something about the major views that exist currently and how they relate to the Christian belief in creation, the creationism that God created the universe, however that's conceived of. So I wanted to say that I began by reviewing all of the, the present day cosmologies and there are a lot of them and they are some of them terribly complicated and they are at loggerheads with one another and then I I got here and I was talking with Paul about it. He tells me about this book by Tegmark that, that shows that most of them don't work at all and that they don't fit with the cosmic background radiation. And so that narrows the field way down. That sounds like an important piece of work. But what, as we talked about it further, um, Paul thought that the really important thing here is to distinguish all these ideas of the origination of the universe, and, or whether it had an origin, and whether it's eternal, and uh, from the doctrine of creation, as we have that in scripture, as that has been understood by Jews and Christians alike for a long, long time. <clears throat> it's called the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. That means there is only God, and then God brings into existence everything, and sustains everything else. And it, it seems to me that some, uh, um, many Christians and almost, and most of the naturalists that I read um, are confused about some very basic points and very basic distinctions. So since this is basic, if you already know it all, it's going to seem really simple. But if you don't, um, it may come as a surprise. So let's start with that, with that idea of creation. The Christian idea that uh, God has created everything out of nothing. That is not itself a cosmology. That does not tell us about the cosmos itself and what it was like when God first brought it into existence or how it's developed since or what nature it has, whether it is a quantum nature basic or something else. It doesn't feed any of that to us. And I say that because many Christians 
think that the Big Bang Theory, for example, would fit perfectly with the Christian religion. Um, if you take, the, based on the, the Hubble calculations, the, the size of the universe now, and you run it backward, you get that the universe is something like 13.8 billion years old. So you say, well, at that point, God brought the, exi the universe into existence. And you need to be very cautious about that. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there was a, there was a Big Bang and there had been a previous <coughs> collapse. Maybe there are alternative universes. Maybe there are multiverses. We don't, we're not given by inspiration any idea or hint <coughs> as to how God brought things about <coughs> or how many or what their nature is. That's what science is for. We, we, we gear ourselves up and we try to find out how the universe works. And we try as best we can to construct its past. And we try as best we can to project to its future. That's why we have science. That's not what we should look to scripture to inform us about. The scriptures are God's revelation to us of his care about us <coughs> and our relationship to him. So the viewpoint that I hold about the scriptures is the one that's called canonical. It means that God, by his, the inspiration of his spirit, has superintended what has come to be written and collected and, and uh, put together into that volume that Jews call the Old Testament, they don't call it the Old Testament, the Torah, the Psalms, and the Prophets. We call, we add to that the New Testament. A Muslim adds to that the Quran. But all three believe that there is an inspired set of writings that records God's dealings with humans. That's why Muslims are right when they refer to Jews and Christians as, like themselves, people of the book. And it is unique in the history of religion. Other religions have writings that they regard as sacred, that they regard as helpful, but not as the, re the record of God's actual dealing with them that's authoritative for how they relate to God. That doesn't even exist. There isn't even a claim to that in any other religion. So what does Scripture give us about creation? Here we have to do a reverse calculation similar to running the Hubble constant backward. We have to take what the Scripture tells us God has created and run it back and ask then what, what, what conditions would have been held when God created. And the answer is none. The New Testament actually says, I don't know if you're aware of this, it says four or five times that God created time. And that God's will for his people is before time everlasting. It says that God created space. So if we run it backward and we take it seriously, then one of the key passages is the first chapter of the book of Colossians. God has created everything visible or invisible, it says. Now, logic students, you all know that it's a tautology, that everything's visible or it's not. That covers everything whatsoever. So it covers all the laws that we find in creation. It covers the relationships. It covers space and time. It covers all the objects and things and all the processes. This is why Jews and Christians have for so many centuries said that God's creation is creation out of nothing. There is only God, and then God calls into existence everything else, and he continues to depend on it. Space, time, matter, laws. Now, I'm going to come to a very controversial point. If you take that at face value, it means also the laws of mathematics and logic. It means that God has brought into existence a creation in which there are quantities, right? Things have quantitative properties, and we represent those quantitative properties by numbers. And then we discover that there are law-like relations between them. Things have logical properties. That sounds odd to some people, so in case it does, you're among them, let me explain what I mean. We tend to think of only <coughs> arguments as having logical properties, right? An argument is either valid or it's not valid. It's sound or it's not sound. 
something functions in an argument as a premise or as a conclusion? How could this glass or this watch have logical properties then? It isn't comprised of statements. But things do have properties that are logical. <coughs> Take, for example, the property of being logically distinguishable from something else. Everything has that. The property of being logically conceivable. Not everything has that. We know and speak of and deal of things in science and in theology and in religion with things we cannot form a concept of, but of which we have only a limiting idea. It's not the same as a concept. In a concept, we distinguish the elements of what we're conceptualizing and combine them in thought into that unity we call a concept. But we have many ideas for which we cannot do that. Shall I give some examples? Yeah. Um, a simple example that's been used before, uh, especially by English philosophers, are colors. We have the idea of the color yellow. Mm -hmm. But that's not a concept because we haven't distinguished all different shades and we put them all together. We're not just yellow. I have a, one uh, that I invented and used in the, in the book that I'm hoping comes out sometime soon. Take the concept of all the numbers no one will ever think of. <laughs> you didn't just think of them by saying that. You thought of the class, but not of any one number, because if you thought of any number in that class, then it would no longer be a member of that class. <laughs> you noticed that. Yeah. So that's an example of a limiting idea. We have an idea that there are numbers no one will ever think of. And there has, to have, there has to be numbers in that class, right? There are an infinity of numbers, so it's clear that there will always be numbers no one's ever thought of. Okay, that's an example of a limiting idea. Now, in religion, in the theology, we use the, 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 the notion of an idea, a limiting idea, for God. If Everything that we know about this creation has been brought into existence by God. Then what's true of God? God is, is, then crosses that limit for us. We can't conceptualize God. If God has called into existence the laws of logic by which we form concepts, we can't form a concept of God's originating being. And that's also part of the Judeo-Christian heritage. That tradition has always taught that there is that about God which is unknowable, completely inconceivable. Not God's like things we do know, but it's so big we can't get our mind around it. No, it's just inconceivable altogether. How then do we know God? Well, that tradition says God took an action, took action to, make, to remedy that situation. God took into himself created characteristics and stood in created relations to creatures and made himself known. There is a long theological tradition that has compromised that and I am aware that it may be gnawing at the back of your minds right now. Wait a minute. Isn't there a tradition that says God didn't create the laws of logic? That they hold for God as much as they do for people because they're parts of God's own being? And the answer is, yes, there is a tradition like that. But I think it violates what we just reminded ourselves of from Colossians 1. If God created everything visible or invisible, it includes the laws of logic. So we cannot form a logical concept of God. And by the same token, we cannot construct a logical proof of God's existence. Now, see if you follow me here. If God is the creator of the laws of logic, and it's creatures, other creatures, that are subject to the laws of logic, like you and me and everything else that we can think of, that if we try to construct a proof of God's reality, we, we lower God from being the creator of those laws to being one more thing subject to those laws. So whatever we can prove would thereby not be the creator of the laws of logic. Whatever we can prove would thereby not be God. We don't believe in God because somebody sat down and wrote a proof on a piece of paper anyway. 
nobody does. People who believe in God believe in God because they experience God. God is not a hypothesis, not a theory invented to explain something, but a real person that we encounter in our lives. And there are many ways that people experience God. Some of them are pretty wild. Some of them are strange and unusual. And most people don't have those experiences. But there is one experience that everybody does have. That is that when they read God's Word, it becomes self-evident to them that this is the truth about God from God. That experience they all have. So without that, they wouldn't believe. I don't want to get too far off. Let's go back to the idea of creation as a limiting idea. Some, um, not only some naturalists, but some Christians have a hard time getting their heads around just how limiting that is, that you can't cross that boundary, that, that between the creator and the creature. What we know are creaturely things, and we know them in accordance with the laws of thought that, by which we naturally think. We can't do anything else. We have to use logical laws. We can use mathematical laws to calculate things. But those that would then be creatures. That's why God increaturated himself, right? In order to make himself known and knowable to us. And of course we say that the epitome of the increaturation was the incarnation. So that he came incarnate in Jesus Christ. Some of the naturalists that can't seem to get their heads around this include people like Richard Dawkins. I don't want to pick on him. But he has more than once said that... Um, he has said, people who believe in God just don't think through what they're thinking about, what they're talking about. Just think how big and complex a being would have to be to know everything about everybody. But that again thinks of God as a physical object in space. And he actually said, and where is he in space? That's not the creator of space. Right? You're, you're not getting it. It's not, I, I don't expect you, him to believe it if it gets straightened out, but at least understand what we're saying. We're saying God is, is transcendent. And that's the term, the traditional term used in theology. To transcend something means to cross a boundary. And when we say, we say this of God, we mean that he is across every boundary. God is independent of space and time and logic and mathematics and physics and, and everything else that's true of the creation. But when by entering into creation, God has taken into himself characteristics of all those kinds. God is one in three. He is present everywhere in space. God is our father because he gives us life. And God is our shepherd and our judge, ultimately. Also, all those things become true of him. Not as a mask or something false pasted over something else. I said it. God takes them into himself and becomes that. One of the medieval theologians in the Eastern Orthodox tradition put it this way. This is St. Gregory Palamas. God, out of a superabundance of love toward us, has imposed upon himself a really diverse mode of existence. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So, it, both, both sometimes Christians misspeak about this, and our naturalists friends also can just get it wrong. I mean, we're not talking about one more big object in the world that's very complex or very powerful. We're talking about the creator who brought into existence every sort of power there is. He's not the greatest cause. God is the creator of all kinds of the, all the kinds of causality there are. Creation is more basic than that. When we talk about causes, they're always delimited. They're of a specific kind, and they hold in specific ways. God's creatorship is not, cannot be conceived of like that, right? And that God is that on which everything else depends and continues to depend at every moment. So it isn't either that God brought into a world that then just goes on its way. Rather, it is that everything other than God would be annihilated were God to withdraw his sustaining power. It would be like... The, the, the writing on your computer screen and you turn the computer off and it's gone.
I paused purposely to see if there were questions. Yes, go ahead. Does the limiting idea principle apply only if God the Creator is separate from the creation? I'm thinking of the Vedanta and Brahman in Hinduism, for example. No, the, um, the idea of a limiting idea can apply um, in pantheistic ideas as well, to pantheistic ideas of divinity. And, and in fact, it does. I, I have no, no problem at all uh, um, in saying that a Hindu thinker would tell you that he would say the same thing about Brahmanatman. He's not able to conceive Brahmanatman at all. But he does not think of Brahmanatman as a separate being from the universe. I thought the point of Hinduism was to realize Atman in yourself and then go back to Brahman. Atman is... <laughs> Brahman Atman is the name of the divine. The divine in everything else is Brahman. Yeah. The divine in you is Atman. Self, yeah. yeah. And, but that... But Brahman Atman cannot be conceived. There is nothing that you can say, no statement that you can make that would be true of him. Of him. Oh, okay. Yeah. You but can't it is, describe it. But it is the being that is in everything. So there's the pantheistic relation, which is what you asked about. Would it have to be that God transcends the world in the Judeo-Christian sense? No. It, it could be said of a, of a pantheistic divinity as well, and it is in, in Hindu thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That doesn't mean nobody thinks of Brahman Atman at all. They do. They meditate and they and what the idea is to be reabsorbed into Brahman Atman. That's the state of Nirvana. Yeah. So uh, limiting ideas can apply to more than just this. I'm just saying they do apply to it. There's a, a long debate about this in the <clears throat> in the history of theology, and I I think since there have been no questions, you know, I, I never know whether people are going to start throwing things when I say this stuff. To say that God transcends even the laws of logic and therefore there's no proof of the existence of God uh, would have been uh, the rest of the night right there in, for a lot of audiences. So since I got away with that much, I'm going to <laughs> do some more. Well, we'll have a discussion at the end, right? What's that? Well, we'll have a discussion at the end. Right? The oh, argument, okay. The argument on the other side, the argument of the theological tradition that says, look, the laws of logic and all the other necessary truths are part of God. They're uncreated. They're not, they don't rule God as though they're something else, but they just are God. And they're parts of his being. And all the, the attributes that are true of God, God's love, his wisdom, his power, his justice, they're all infinite perfections, and they exist in God. So they've never been created. Now, think with me for just a few minutes about one implication of that. Let's say goodness. God has perfect goodness. There are things in the world that have goodness. Human actions occasionally are good. It isn't all bad, right? But that means that if a human action actually has goodness, it participates in the goodness of God. God has the infinite perfection, but all instances of goodness are less, are less than perfect, but still instances of the same uncreated goodness. Goodness can be infinite in God and finite in us, but it can't be uncreated in God and created in us and be the same thing. That's a flat-out contradiction. The same thing can't be uncreated and created. And that's a real problem, isn't it? That means that every characteristic of God, when shared by humans, the humans are to that extent uncreated. They're not just creatures. They're actually divine. They're partly divine. There are other, other nasty things that follow from this as well. The other theology, on the other hand, the, and that's the Orthodox theology, has always said this about God being... In, in fact, the first view holds that the definition of God is the being with all and only perfections. The Reformed and Orthodox view is put, put like this. This is Basil of Caesarea. If there are perfections, God created them. He's not sure whether there are, but if there are, God created them. In other words, God has created. The, the, his, the nature 
which he reveals to us. And that's the way Calvin put it in the Institutes. The fourth, the fourth book begins of speaking of the nature in which God is pleased to manifest himself. Not what he has to be and cannot help but be. Here's another contrast. If God just is all in all the perfections, then God has no real free will. He always has to do what's best. You and I may have free will, but God doesn't. So are you just using the word God to describe like random universe concepts? Like it's not no. it's really like a stand-in for other things that's really something we can't no, describe? No, I, uh, no, no, no. I was explaining that to, the, to begin with. The, the biblical idea of God that's in Judaism and Christianity is a transcendent creator. But, the, but then there, God is described as having taken on these characteristics in order to relate to us. So you just described the concept, sorry, like maybe this is a stupid describe question. I don't want to like direct discussion, but the, so you're basically saying there's this entity you refer to as God, and then you add ideas from a particular set of theologies, like Christianity and Judaism, right, and saying like they describe God that way, and then you're adding the limiting idea to it, saying you can't really abide by the laws of logic, and then you're attributing it, attributing it to it a bunch of logical attributes, which seems kind no. of contradicting what you're saying. <clears throat> no, sorry. Let, let me uh, go through it again and try to put it in the right order. I'm not saying, first of all, that we get an idea that there's something uh, other than the universe, the universe depends on, and then we make up some idea of what that might be like. Um, what I said was that um, people who come to believe in God do so because they find that when they read this, the biblical account of God, that it becomes self-evident to them that that's the truth about God from God. So they start not with the, that some vague idea, but they start with God as God has entered into creation and contacted people and made himself known, and this is, the scripture is the record of it. So, so that's, how the, that's how they begin. So with Sorry, so yeah. does that mean that you're basically saying that God can only exist if humans who read the scripture think that God exists? No, of course not. I'm, and, and that's no more than saying that Mount Everest exists only if we read about it and believe it. Uh, we're, we're talking about um, the being that is presented as the creator of everything. That, among the other characteristics, of the characteristics, characteristics of being loving and caring about people and, and providing a destiny for them, it's also this... Uh, he is identified as the creator of everything. Now from that you run back to if he has created everything visible or invisible, then what can you say about his originating being? And the answer is nothing. Mm -hmm. You could say he's the creator of everything. Yeah. Right. right. But, but you can't further describe it. Yeah. Right. Because he transcends the category. Yeah, that's right. But, but he's already made himself known. I mean, that's where we start. We start because we encounter with God as He has made Himself known in creation through the cre well, plus through the Scriptures and through Jesus. That's the that's, what that's Christianity. The right? Scriptures, the record of it, and Christ was the embodiment of it. But those are assumptions that you're making. But those are true necessarily. I'm I'm not assuming it's true. I'm telling you why people believe it because oh, they encounter it, it as self-evident. <coughs> so, yeah, right. So, so because people emotionally... You know what, let's... let's sorry, yeah. sorry, 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 sorry. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, there, there will be discussion, but we have one. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, this sounds like an afterword. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the inclusion of, of, of logic is uh, upsetting to most people to say that that's created because then it applies to all creatures and it applies to the, the cosmos in which we live and everything we, with which we deal, but not... To God, so there's no proof available for God, and I think all the attempts to prove that God exists do fail. They demonstrably fail. I've I've seen a lot of them. Uh, I don't know that I missed any class of them, even if there are specific members of the class I may not know about. And the cl as a class, they don't work. If you if people who um, defend proving or constructing such proofs. Uh, want to press the issue, I would say that it's easy to prove that something is self-existent, but not that it's the God we are talking about, the God revealed in Scripture. That something is self-existent doesn't even need an argument, in my opinion. If you simply take the, con the idea, the sum total of reality, 
it would have to be self-existent in part or whole because there's nothing else for it to depend on. So you don't need some clever modal logical argument um, that, that's extremely abstruse. Um, something is self-existent. And I think that that, that really is um, how religion gets started. People uh, came to the point where they were able to ask and consider answers to the question, what's the self-existent reality everything else depends on? And that is what's common to all religions. So I, if religions disagree on who or what is the divine reality, but they all agree the divine reality is whatever it is that's self-existent and the origin of everything else. And people can put the cosmos in that slot, and do. They can put matter in that slot. They can put matter plus logical laws, or matter plus mathematics. Some people have put space in that, but space is infinite and eternal and spontaneously generates matter. There, there are all a panoply of candidates for that. And Jews and Christians say it's the transcendent creator. That's, that's the difference. Neither one of them can construct the proof that what they were regarding as self-existent is self-existent. I don't know of anybody even attempting to prove matter is self-existent. They've attempted to prove God is the creator, and those attempts all are terrible. Mm -hmm. They all fail. But, yeah. I'm not sure if I, if you were drawing a distinction, or I was confused about it, but saying you, your your firm is saying that God created logic. Um, but did God create goodness? And how can he create it to be his yes. himself good? So like, why is there a distinction between goodness and logic? Could you just put anything? I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Why I didn't hear the last thing. A distinction. Well, only because they're not the same thing. Um, uh, whether, um, whether something is, is uh, logically distinguishable is not the same as whether it's, say, morally just. They're just not the same. It's not the same property, that's all. So you would say that God is not intrinsically logical, even though he's intrinsically good? No. No. About God's originating being that transcends the world, you can't say anything, except that it's that's the basis for everything else, ontologically. That God has brought, in, brought into being everything else. As God has chosen to enter into creation to redeem human beings and bring them into fellowship with himself. God has taken on a nature which is good, which is logically uh, consistent, which is just, which is powerful. All the things that he brought into existence, he takes in, and that's him imposing a really diverse mode of existence on himself with creaturely characteristics, properties, and subject to laws. But then, the question on that then, how would that mesh with scriptures where God is talking and he says, I am the Lord thy God, I do not change. Yes, the, the uh, meaning of that is that he doesn't change when he has made a promise. He doesn't go back on his word. And sometimes and it's translated in the old English term, repent. But they use that not just mean, not only to mean to say I'm sorry for doing something wrong, but they meant, use it in the sense of renege. I bail out on a promise. I, I promised you this, now I'm not going to do it. That he says he won't do. And for the rest, does God change in relation to, a, to people? Obviously. You know, the scripture is full of that, is it not? When Jesus Christ was on the cross, God turns his back on it because he bears the sin of the world. Then, God, then Jesus has God's approval. He's exalted the king of the universe. God rejoices over sinners who repent. Is, if you take the view that God is all and only perfections, then God can't change. Do you, under, you understand why? Because if God has all the perfections, whatever they are, and he has only perfections, the only way he can change is to become an imperfect. So perfection would never choose to do that. That's how the argument goes. But, that whole notion of there being such things as perfections and God possessing them all comes right smack out of Plato. It has nothing to do with Genesis or the New Testament. 
it's Greek philosophical thought that has no place in this. It's like, so I fully understand and agree with your point about it being possible to prove the existence of God. That's, I think that's very clear. But have you heard, I'm sure you have, the term a pointer to God? And sometimes people speak of certain facts about the universe that they say are pointers. Sure. What do Look, you think of that term? For someone who already believes in God, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there are experiences that confirm it. Right. Just like a confirming instance of a hypothesis. If this is what I would expect if that were true, then it tends to confirm it. Okay. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I would define religious experience as any experience that generates, deepens, or confirms mm -hmm. a religious belief. Okay. A religious belief is a belief in anything as divine, no matter how it's conceived. It's the self-existent origin of everything else, or how how the non-divine depends on the divine, or, and the, the third part that we mostly think about as religion, how humans come to stand in proper relation with the divine. And so that's religious belief and religious experience. Of it. But it's absolutely right, of course. People have confirming experiences of various beliefs all the time, and they do of their divinity beliefs. And, and people have also had the experience of having their divinity beliefs disconfirmed, and they give them up. Yeah. Yes. Um, one question. If in the light of where you're talking about where God doesn't have the free will as we think of free will, <laughs> yeah. and then if our goodness sort of is inherited from God, how does evil, where does evil come from? <clears throat> okay, let me try to... Divide the question. I'm trying to think of a hard question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get it wrong? <laughs> this is first of all, <laughs> first of all, if the the view that God is all and only perfections is not a view that I'm advocating, I'm criticizing it. The and view I'm, that is only. I'm trying to give you reasons to believe it's not true, oh. and and that it's not the right way to see the Judeo-Christian view of God. It comes from Plato and not. Right. Right. Okay. Is this like the Platonic ideal? Is that? Yes. Yeah. Plato, Plato's theory was one of the most influential theories anybody ever thought of, <laughs> and still plagues us. I, it's it's like a, it's like a stray cat or a bill collector. It just keeps coming back. <laughs> <laughs> what here's here's his theory. He thought that there were certain things about the world as he experienced it that were puzzling, and and then he thought of a theory that explained them all. There's another realm, another dimension to reality. And in the other dimension are all the perfections. Now he thought of this in a relatively crude way, but, but it, it has its sophisticated advocates today. He thought that in this other realm was the perfect horse, and all horses are imperfect copies of the perfect one in the perfect realm. There's, in the other realm is the perfect blue. In the other realm is the perfect triangle. Line, point, all the numbers are there. I know mathematicians and physicists who believe that. I know you do. I said it has its present day advocates. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's and Plato thought that those that, that the perfections in that other world were eternal, uncreated, changeless, and everything in this world depends on them. Because everything is an imperfect copy of that of that other world. Um, it, it also is reminiscent of Pythagoras because Pythag the Pythagoreans thought that the numbers were divine. In fact, I started my, uh, my first book with a quote of a prayer that the Pythagoreans made to the number 10. <laughs> <laughs> Can I track uh, sure. a question down? Because uh, you alluded to some of the Eastern Orthodox uh, theologians. Yeah. And so this long-standing tradition in classic and patristic theology of the apophatic cataphatic distinction of the positive way and the negative way. So could you comment on how that, how you see that in relation to the kind of uh, 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 viewpoint that you're trying to present? Okay, I, I think that's exactly what I just presented. Okay, it sounds like it, and yeah, I'm just sure. trying to say you're trying to appropriate into that. No, I'm trying to explain that. But that's also Western and the, the whole... August, Augustinian Thomistic tradition slots into a kind of Neoplatonism that also 
appropriates the apophatic cataphatic. But, but, but not in the same sense. Not in the same sense. So I'm just trying to get so, a sense on like, where, okay. where are you going with this? this the, the two different senses are this. In, in the Orthodox, and it's true of the Calvinists too, <clears throat> God's transcendence transcends everything about the universe in that he brought it all into existence and all the kinds of properties and all the laws. And the, the Augustinian Thomistic tradition says all but the ones true of God. The ones true of God are eternal, and so he didn't bring those into existence. So there are exceptions. So the God's unknowability in, the, in that tradition means he has these characteristics to such a perfect degree that we can't conceive of that degree, not we can't conceive of them at all. How would, in, in the classic um, um, debates and distinctions about language about God with this mm -hmm. medical, equivocal, and analogical presentation, right. so how do we speak about God so that our language makes sense? How, how, how basically would you articulate okay. like that aspect See, on, of the, on, the, on the first tradition, on the, the Western tradition, Augustine and Selma Aquinas, they come up with a, an elaborate theory of analogy. So God has perfections, and we don't have the infinite degree of those perfections. That doesn't exist anywhere in creation. But what we do have is like what God has. That, that's what analogy means, there's yes. a likeness. <clears throat> um, I tried to offer this in the less, less technical, but now I'm going <laughs> to... Okay in a less technical way. For there to be an analogy, though, there has to be a sameness. Two things can't be like one another unless they're in some way the same. Okay? Thomas Aquinas seems to realize this. What he offers is what he calls his theory of proper proportionality. That's his, for his, how language, our language applies to God. God has the infinite degree of whatever it is, goodness. We have some lesser degree. Ours is like God's because it's the same quality of goodness. It's just the degree that's different. He calls it the mode in which it's possessed. So there's the res significata, the, the quality being signified. The modus significandi, the mode in which it's possessed, finitely, imperfectly, perfectly. But the, but the quality itself has to be the same. And that was, remember me saying, that makes us partly divine. And if you do this now... Not I'm not sure if Thomas would go there. Uh, uh, how's he going to get out of it? Because the, 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 there's, there's a legitimate similarity, but there's always an ever greater dissimilarity. And therefore, there's a fundamentally inarticulate, unknowable dimension to all analogy. But the un unknowable is on the side of the perfection. We can't grasp the infinite perfection. That's right. But the quality we possess has to be the same quality that God possesses. Well, the problem is in that word same and what that's we right. mean by it. That's the, that's, it, that's the, it, the, the gist of this I'm long... But that's what uh, it is in self It's yes. the same race significant. It's uncreated. So there's something in us that's uncreated. And that, that becomes true not only about goodness, but justice, power, mercy, love. They all now are un, uncreated. And the other difficulty is that this is combined in Aquinas' thought with Augustine's doctrine of the simplicity of God. All these things are actually unified in God. That means they all are God. And now you can't get the creature in God. You can't distinguish them. That's a, that's a serious difficulty. That, that I'm not sure. Yeah, I, think I, I think I disagree on that point. Okay. That's more than I think we can get into it. That's, that's, uh, let me just contrast the orthodox mm -hmm. thing and then we can draw this. For the Orthodox, God has taken on created characteristics. So our language is inimical. When it says God loves you, it means exactly what we think, what we mean. When it says God's angry with that, don't do it, it means just exactly what we mean. The difference isn't that the property is infinite, the difference is who loves you and who's angry with you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. That was the one side I wanted to put. I wanted to put aside. If if there is evil in the world, it's because God brought the world into existence to have evil in it. There's take the there's last part again? there's no backing away from that. God called 
created the world, yeah. and there's evil in it, it's because that was his intention. Okay. And this is, this is um, explicit in the Jewish tradition, speaking about Adam, the Talmud says God created Adam with evil intent as well as good intent. So when he was tested, he had a real free will choice to make. And he chose well. So original sin is basically the, assuming it exists at all, but the concept of original sin is because God allowed man to make choices between good and evil, which meant that the creator created evil and the possibility of evil too. Did I explain it? Created the possibility, sure. But not, God didn't create cancer, for example. No, but God created a world in which cancer is possible. Sure. And he created, he created human beings so that they are faulty. And he created them, but he also gave them the freedom to choose. Cancer? No. To make choices. We don't get to make choices about lots of things, you know? Looking better than we do, being taller, being younger, for example. <laughs> we don't get to choose that. Is this related to the greater good defense of... No. no. Uh, I'm... Yeah, now, now it's shifted again a little bit. <laughs> First was, why is there evil in the world at all? This is a question about why God allows unjust suffering in the world. And there have been three main arguments that have been proposed to answer that, and I don't think any of them work. Um, one is the greater good, the other is the free will defense. And the, the third is the, uh, the idea that it tests people and makes them better, it improves them to suffer. But didn't one of the philosophers have the idea that you can't have the presence of one entity like goodness without its existence of its opposite? So therefore you wouldn't, in our world as human beings, we would never know goodness if we didn't also have it an antimer or um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anybody actually put it just like that. Right. Plato, Plato comes close to that in some ways. And that, and that, and, yeah. I'm sorry, that doesn't seem convincing to me. I learned to tell colors by contrasting them one another, not to what's colorless. Why couldn't we have a world in which there are just many kinds of goods, and we learn to distinguish them by contrasting one another, and it's all, it's all good. I so I don't see that you have to have the lack of it to know the. The proper. But it's actually not the lack of it. I think badness is not necessarily the absence of goodness. I think they're two separate entities. Okay. So you're. Um, and I'm sorry. I, I'm I should point this that. out so that you, people don't end up confused. You were you were talking about the question: Why would God allow unjust suffering? You are not. You're talking about why is there anything evil at all in the world? in any sense of evil, not not just undeserved suffering, right. but, yeah. Right. So, I, I like his question better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, um, yeah, it, the, the question about why God would allow something has to do with God's own intentions, and I think the proper answer is we don't know. Why did God make this world? I don't know. But you know what? Nobody from any other point of view, from any other idea of the self-existent the reality that generates everything else, nobody has any idea. If you ask a Hindu or a Buddhist, well then why, God, why does Brahmanatma generate this kind of a world? I don't know. It beats me. I have no idea. You, I, what, why does the world turn out to have just these creatures and this, these problems? I don't know. I don't think anybody has any answer. There's a lot of questions we can ask that don't have answers. Mm -hmm. well, I was getting to where you're saying that the, uh, God created the world with possibility for evil. He didn't create sure. evil, but he created the possibility sure. of evil. I mean, the greater good defense uh, of evil makes, makes sense to me that, I mean, well, you can't appreciate the greater goods of justice, courage, and love unless you have the possibility for their... Uh, antithesis. Yeah. Just like I can't, I can't appreciate pain unless I can feel it. Yeah, well, let me, I don't want to just 
you know, dismiss it, sound like I'm dismissing it, because there's there are merits in that, uh, to things that come up in that discussion. But I think the, what it comes down to is this. If God wanted you to, wanted there to be a world with all goods in it and, and no pain, and wanted you to be able to appreciate not being in pain, he could bring it about that you could do that. Okay. So you wouldn't have to suffer to, to, to gain the, the knowledge if God made you so that you could do it. You know, we, we, Jews and Christians are people, and Muslims too, are people that believe that the world is headed for a destiny. And that destiny is that God will call in, call a halt, renovate the universe, the way of judgment of human beings, and he'll establish his everlasting king in the kingdom in which there will be no suffering. So if God can do that at the end, why didn't he start out with it? There's no answer to that. This is what he wanted. Why? Can't second guess. Or you want to say it's, what, what, it's just random, it's what happened. How does the multiverse fit into this, if it does at all? Assuming yeah. there is one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so can we stop with <laughs> with, uh, with sin and... Yeah. And all, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say something at the end of this I think, I, I think the multiverse uh, theory um, has a lot in common with ancient Epicureanism. Epicurus held that uh, there's an, an infinite number of atoms in an infinite amount of space, and given enough time, they will assume every possible combination. This is one possible combination, obviously, or it wouldn't be here. And it's obviously one of the combinations of atoms that's more permanent, more stable, so it's been here long enough so that life evolves, people appear, and so on. And that's the explanation for the world the way it is. Um, what, what we have now is uh, the cosmological theories that do this not just with atoms and their combinations, but possible universes. Well, I think this is the only one. And in some models, there are mathematical reasons to think there are others. I don't know where you wanted to go with that, but, but that's, I don't know what else to say. Okay. You've already told me this is like Epicureanism, which is something I didn't know before, so thank you. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what Epicurus said about the atoms and the possible combinations is what the uh, people are, some people are now saying about possible universes. There's, a, there's a, a, an analogy you could. Yeah. What is the. Um, the the history of that line of thought. I know you brought up Epicureanism, um, but specifically with the multiverse theory, was it a reaction against the fine-tuning argument? It seems like how I've seen it posed before you know, anyways. Uh, I'm not sure that I have a, a, a bead on just how, you know, what the history of that is. My impression was that um, as opposed to the Big Bang theory, some people propose, well, there may be more than one universe. Not only might this one oscillate, but there may be others as well. I think, like, I, I can't come from theological perspective, but from scientific perspective, and just looking at the history of science, it, this is just my observation, but there used to be a geocentric model of the universe, and all of a sudden it became heliocentric, and then we found that, hey, we live in this universe called Milky Way, essentially. Then we're like, oh wait, there are other galaxies, and it's like every time we were like, oh, we're the center of the universe, it kept expanding, expanding, expanding. So, just like there are multiple galaxies, not just the one Milky Way that we live in, it is a possibility that there are other universes, and just based on the anthropic principle, generally speaking, just we just happen to be observing the universe that we can observe because we've evolved in the universe where we could evolve. But right. there could possibly be other universes, and time becomes a little bit. Less. Right, but each of those advances in terms of how we came to understand the universe came as a result of evidence, right? Whereas this multiverse right. theory seems it's like it's more it's, it's a hypothesis. So it's it's theoretical. It comes out yeah. of yeah. Uh, eternal right. inflation. Right. If you have certain under certain right. schools of eternal inflation, you're going to have a whole bunch of uh, you know, those little quantum things happening and creating a new universe. And there's also a uh, string theory 
you know, there's going to be a whole bunch of universes, almost by definition, or some mathematical schools of string theory. And then, oh, well, the guy, the guy believes that, you know, the weight function doesn't collapse, but just creates a new universe every time, certain conditions. That, 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 yeah, so there's like three, those are three of the main schools of physics now, and, you know, they all basically lead you to some kind of multiverse or another. Okay, so it is mathematically based. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's compelled mathematically okay. from three but it's not here, so Yeah, there's, yes, no. exactly. There's no empirical experiment right. devised yet. A little analytical. Yeah. I mentioned earlier that the math, in, in some cases, leads you to believe there are things. Mathematically, those things are beautiful, but... Yeah. It's, it's one way of reading a mathematical uh, representation right. yes. of the universe, but of course... Uh, I mean, my own perspective on multiverses and things like that, and the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, which is Hugh Everett, is uh, it's it's uh, it's it's considerable amount of speculation unconstrained by evidence, mm -hmm. yeah. and and basically it's driven more by uh, mathematical considerations yeah. and abstractions. But yet, uh, if you have something that's fundamentally unprovable, uh, then essentially it's it's a, it just it's a doing a kind of metaphysics. It's not physics. Right. Yeah. Although it comes out, often comes out of the category of physics. That's one physicist's perspective. Yeah. I mean, you'll find many perspectives. Yeah. And it's the sort of thing we just may never be able to find out about mm -hmm. empirically. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that what you were? Yeah, so I guess to summarize, it, it comes from sort of a, a certain interpretation of mathematics or a certain extrapolation of mathematics, but it's not necessarily purely a philosophical reaction to the fine-tuning mm -hmm. argument. No, it doesn't. Okay. Doesn't because it is raised as, a, as an objection to the argument. Yeah. I don't know if it came but, about. But whether it is a motive, I don't know. You'd have to know right. how somebody was yeah, you'd taking have to know in their what mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there are things that I, yeah, I don't know about physicists, but from string theory, I think, that suggest that there are more dimensions than, than more universes potentially. Mm -hmm. right. so, but it's not. Yeah. By the way, just as an historical comment, um, the idea that we were at the center of the universe mm -hmm. is uh, something that Aristotle proposed, uh, became very influential uh, mm -hmm. from that. But um, in Aristotle's proposal, that had nothing to do with aggrandizing human beings. In fact, uh, people have gotten it backward. Aristotle thought that because we were at the center of the universe, it was the lowest point in the universe. It was something like a drain. It's where all the uh, <laughs> stuff goes. In his view, every other part of the universe was better than this one <laughs> and higher. And in fact, he didn't think humans were the highest beings in the universe. He speculated that in the other reaches where things were better, there were higher intelligences than ours. If so you want a good uh, uh, depiction of that, get C.S. Lewis's The Discarded Image, where he talks about the medieval universe yeah. and, and basically it says precisely what yeah. you just said, but in, at great length and with C.S. Lewis's wonderful poetic uh, right. style. So, yeah, I mean, Thanks. you're right. You're, I, I think you're, you know, that's, yeah. that's what. But a lot of times people make fun of that view and say it's just an attempt of humans to aggrandize themselves and it was just the reverse <laughs> as it just presented. You know, and I, I can't resist the observation that at this point, uh, uh, well, this is my aside. It's not part of my presentation. <laughs> that a lot of times what's happened in the history of the interactions between scientific advances and Christians and theology is that the Christians have listened to the scientists and they've taken over a certain theory and then they've sort of incorporated it into their theology. Not a good idea. And then when the science changes, the scientists point to them and say, you ignorant idiots, you're getting blah, 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 but that's because they listen to the scientists. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it's important then to keep the two things each in its own domain. Because the science is going to change. And if we're doing theology the way we ought to, there's progress there too. Um, what about a cyclical universe? How does this, I mean, one that just collapses, expands, collapses, expands. I guess there's no creator at all in that universe. Why not? The well, question, yeah. The, the question is still, isn't it, what is it that's the self-existent reality on which everything else depends? And if you've said God, it doesn't matter whether the universe collapses and expands once, whether there are dozens or an infinite number of them, it, it, it wouldn't matter. If, if, if it's 
God, who is the creator of everything other than himself, then it's God who is the creator of the universe that expands and tracks and collapses and expands. And What's the difference? Which view you hold of the universe? It's going to be dependent on God. So I, I, I've talked to Buddhists to sort of inclined toward a cyclical universe. Uh -huh. Man, they don't think there's a creator. Of course they think it just is. You know, that yeah, that is. No, everything. They, of course they don't. Yeah, they do not. It, and that's that's the difference between. Well, it's, if we get into that, we'll be here a while. The, yeah. the, in Hinduism, there is a creation story. It, it, there is the, the element in Hindu theology that every once in a while Brahmanatman dissolves the world and, and brings into existence a brand new one. Um, Buddhism has no creation story because they think that will lead you to, lead you to imagine things like the biblical view that there's a being that created the world. That's not true. If they're even afraid of, of talking about Brahmanatman um, and so they repudiate. They repeat the concept of Atman. There is no self in Buddhism. That's right. And there, and what? So what they wanted? They so they replace the term with the term nothingness. Emptiness. But yeah, yeah. but the nothingness is self-existent. Yeah. And I'll show that to you. It's it's in. This always gives me a headache. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, think of it this way. Existent it's nothing. no thing. It's not anything that we can conceive of, but that, that's what's self-existent, and everything else is illusion. That, and the word for illusion is maya, in, both in Hinduism and Buddhism. So that you have the, the... Now, the difference is that the Hindu thinks that the world of maya has its own intrinsic orderliness, and there are really laws that can be discovered, so people can do things like science and technology. The Buddhist thinks there is no order to Maya whatsoever, that even logic can't be trusted, things are really contradictory, and no science is possible, and that the only salvation for you is to reject the entire world of illusion altogether, and that's the only way you'll escape being reborn into another life of suffering and be absorbed into nirvana. I got kicked out of several Buddhist groups. There are several. <laughs> <laughs> I found that difficult to understand. There are several forms of Buddhism. The Mahayana and Theravada are well known, but there's also yeah. Japanese Pure Land Buddhism Tibetan. and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So there's that's right. There's no creator, but there's a divinity. Yeah. There's no creator because there's no world. And if they don't believe there's any immortal aspect of anything or permanent aspect of anything, yet most Buddhists, I think, they'll believe in reincarnation or rebirth. And they have difficulty explaining what gets reborn. So I'm no. That's when it's they start more than just out. difficulty, yeah. yeah. Of course, they also, <laughs> two schools of thought, you know, in the 8th century met in Tibet and had a, had a, a, a debate that lasted years as to whether we, there's, we have a self or we don't. So half of them were arguing there's no self at all. Not illusion. Oh. So, yes, Paul? Yeah, I wonder if you could just go back and talk a little bit more about this important point about transcendence in relation to creationism and where the creationists go astray with this uh, view. And, okay. what, and um, what is it about creation evolution? That okay. And I'll, I'll, uh, I promise to finish with that. And, uh, and I'll say some things about the, the Genesis text, too, that come out of the article, just for people who haven't read it. Um, well, first of all, the, the canonical view here that I mentioned earlier of the scripture, uh, the, the Jewish scripture and the, the New Testament added, it, is that <coughs> this is a, uh, an inspired and preserved account of God's contacts with human beings. So that, and it's, it's provided to them as an authoritative way for them to live their lives in relation to God. It is not there to solve problems about in physics or astronomy or chemistry or anything else. It's just not what it was given for. It was never used that way. And as I a point I made just the other night, when you the, the view you take of what it is, what kind of literature it is you're reading, determines how you read it. 
if, if I'm handed a document, say, from the ancient world, I just know that it's old, and I don't know whether this is a laundry list, whether this is a work contract, whether, um, whether this is um, a record of a, of a marriage, whether it's a record of a court case, whether it's somebody's poetry, if I don't know what it is, I really am kind of lost as to how to read it. I have, to, I have some assumption that what the whole is guides my reading of the parts. So what happens for, uh, with our, <coughs> our friends, the, the creationists, is that they pick this up and they, uh, they pick up Genesis and other parts of scripture, and w what they want to do is read it as though it's 21st century science and technology. Instead of understanding, wait a minute, yo, this stuff is thousands of years old. This was written before there was any science, and before the, and when technology was very primitive. You know, as far as we know, ladies and gentlemen, theories were invented by a guy named Thales somewhere around 600 BC, not before that. Moses lived 700 years earlier than that. He wasn't writing theories. They're not hypotheses. Then you have to understand the literature, the type of literature it is, and the type in this case is that it's part of a covenant document, a religious covenant document. Moses covenant. And it has to be read that way. So it starts with God created the world. That's right. It doesn't say how. They want to insist that it does say how long it took him. Uh, this is old stuff for most of you, but in case you, there's someone here who hasn't seen it, let me just point this out. It talks about creation in six days and God rests the seventh day. Do you remember what happened the first day? What is God doing? Genesis. Light. All right. He separates light from darkness. The second day. Water. water. Okay. Water in, oh, in the firmament and the ocean. And the third day? Land. Ocean and land. Okay. That's what he said to separate, arrange, some orderliness. What happens in day four? Sun, light. Stars. Lights for the dark and the night. Sun, moon, stars. Sun, moon, and stars. Sun, moon, and stars. So even ancient commentators said, wait a minute, these aren't six literal days. You don't get the sun till day four. What happens to day five? Birds and fish. Birds and sea life. And day five? Animals and humans. See any see any arrangement there? Yeah. You think that's an accident? What? No. The the point. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think they go together. Yes. Four, two, five, three. Yeah. One, two, and three are the background oh, yeah, conditions for four, five, and six. The point is that the writer is giving you what's called a teleological order. A teleology. God's, this is, it's unfolding God's purposes. And it's arranged in a story that's laid out like a work week. Why? Because part of the covenant with Moses was going to be, if you read on further, you read the next part, six days shall you labor and do all your work, the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, and it you shall do no work, neither you nor your servant. Right? Mm -hmm. So it lays out in the form of a work week a teleological order. It's all God's purpose. And it shows that, it, I don't know how anything could show more clearly, that it's not supposed to be taken as six literal days. Not only that, the seventh day is the day God rests. And in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews says the seventh day is still going on. So I'm afraid that our friends... Um, the creationists have badly misread, first of all, what kind of a book it is, and therefore misread its internal structure and purpose. And that's a large part of what I was trying to do in that article in some more detail. Yes? I'm, I'm thinking there's also an a aspect of the uh, transcendence. So many of them emphasize the historicity of the text, that it talks about... Uh, something that can be measured with an ordinary clock. 
and in other words putting the whole thing into this physical realm as opposed to this transcendence that you were talking about right so in a sense the creationists and the atheists uh, like Dawkins are both making the same assumption right that this is a intended as a yeah, chronological a mistake. newspaper but report. Unfortunately, Dawkins has endorsed it. He said the evangelicals have it right. That they're uh -huh. reading it the right way. Well, I'm sorry. That's not, not true. Um, God, what, in what we were talking about before, God transcends everything. And, in, in, and we have it as part of scripture that God created even time. So the creation itself is timeless. It's, it's from eternity God creates. It's not an, an event that takes place in time. It's the event that brings into existence time and space and matter. So that means this even if there was, even if we discovered that the universe was a steady state universe, that would not rule out the possibility of uh, creation. No. No. Something can be eternal and eternally dependent on something else. The point is what is it that's dependent and what is it that's not? <coughs> I've used the expression self existent. For, for the divine in, in religions, but perhaps the logically cleanest way to put it is that it's what is unconditionally non-dependent. And that's the, that's the question. And we have differences all over the place. What is it that's unconditionally non -dependent? Going back just a couple of minutes, uh, you mentioned the view that the seventh day is continuing from the New Testament. Do you know this? There's a reference to that. In it's in the book of Hebrews. I can get you the. Uh, I'll send it to you if you write to me. I'll give you the, the text if you want it. Yeah, it speaks of um, God entering into His rest, His Sabbath rest. That means the seventh day rest. And then it says that all who love Him will uh, be given their rest too. When they die, they will enter into His rest, and they continue to do so. Do you remember that? I don't remember which chapter. Uh, I can Sorry. Yeah. You <laughs> before? Four. Yeah. That, that what you had in mind? Yeah. Okay. I promised not to go on and on, and I said we could open up for Q and A. And happy to do it. That's on the nose. And now I hear. Oh, oh.